Extreme weather conditions are affecting almost every part of the globe. We are in this together. So why not learn from each other and pool our knowledge to address real problems? Welcome to a new edition of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Kahomza Twinobio, right here in Kampala, Uganda. Hi Sandra, I agree. One area where help is certainly needed is in agriculture. How can we improve our food security? More on that later. I am Chris Alems, coming to you from Lagos, Nigeria. Here's what's coming up. More than a tree environmentalist in Kenya seek to rescue the iconic baobab. Farmers in Spain show how vegetables can flourish despite the drought. And the Uganda farmer aiming to change the world at the helm of the slow food movement. As you know, we are all about solutions here on Eco Africa. So how about this for a great idea? The UN Development Program gathers up inventions from all over the globe that promote sustainable development and then shares them just where they are needed. In Guinea, one initiative is targeting remote rural communities who now stand to benefit from a whole catalogue of solutions. A trip to some of the most remote areas of Guinea this is a first for the team from the UNDP Accelerator Lab. Equipped with a digital map and a database of sustainable projects, they are here to inform local people about potential solutions to problems they may be facing. First stop is the village of Kubia. There are 91 of these Accelerator Lab teams working in 114 countries across the globe. So today you can access and learn from people who found solutions to problems all over the world. Some problems will have to wait for a solution, but there does seem to be a potential answer for water supply issues thanks to the digital map which is accessible online. We don't pretend to have all the answers, but what we did share with them right away, the first solution that we presented, was a water collection basin, a runoff basin. This is already used in Burkina Faso, but it hasn't been introduced here, in Kubia. Musa Kamara spent two years tracking down innovations across the country, like this one from Gbade Koivogi. He recycles plastic waste, breaking it down into particles and then building solid panels, which are then used to make a biodigester, like this blue box. It is used to decompose organic waste, creating fertilizer, as well as methane gas, which can be captured and put to use. What we're asking for is help with getting our patents, which have almost been filed. In fact, some have been filed. And we'd like reassurance that our products won't be duplicated without our consent. Musa Kamara listens and asks questions. He needs to ensure the project fits Accelerator Lab's criteria. He and his team are looking for ideas that are innovative, community-oriented, easily transferable and resource-efficient. If approved, Accelerator Lab will help Bade Koivogi obtain a patent and find funding. In exchange, his innovation will be integrated into a lab's database so that it can be shared with the communities who could benefit from it. Once Musa Kamara receives written agreement from an innovator, he adds their solution to a global map which users can access online. These days, a lot of decisions are made at the macro level. But many of our communities fall through the cracks because these decisions don't reach them. Or even if they do, they don't take the community's aspirations into account. So we have to play that role. Together with a team of volunteer engineering students, Musa Kamara returns to Kuibia to visit a villager who is struggling to irrigate her land due to rising temperatures. 
Hadja Adama Korka Diallo is keen to see if the run of Basin, which she discovered on the online map during the recent meeting, might be a solution. She shows the team two possible places it could go. We thought we could do it here. The team needs to conduct a feasibility assessment and then find a way to implement the solution. They'll go up and pass on the information. And if it's accepted there, they'll let us know. Next, the team heads to a plantation which is suffering from an infestation. One of the volunteer engineers shows the farmers a natural insecticide which features on the accelerator lab's map. Composed of garlic, chili pepper, oil and soap, it is both simple and cost effective. Three liters cost just one euro as opposed to five euros for the same amount of chemicals. The farmers will now share their knowledge with other local people. Even if we're in Conakry, we can call them and they'll be able to help, even if they're not agronomists. And now it's time for the lab team to move on. Together with precious problem-beating information, that they hope to share with as many people as possible. Amazing! We see there how global knowledge and cooperation can provide real help at the local level, which brings us to our next story. The Slow Food Movement was founded nearly 40 years ago in Italy and is now a global organization. That is right, Chris. But its vision is to, to give every human being access to food that is produced locally. That is one big vision. And last year, a farmer and agronomist right here in Uganda took over as the new international president. So, let's meet him. He knows his way around the local market of Bra. Edward Mukibi studied here in the Italian city at the Slow Food University. Now he's heading up the movement. Bra uh, helped also me to interact with other uh, cultures, other people, but also to understand uh, uh, the historical birthplace of slow food and where it all began. The slow food movement started in Italy in 1986, a country known for its wine and hazelnuts as well as a plethora of other delectable specialties. Right from the start, it was a grassroots movement. Its visionary founder, Carlo Petrini, took up the fight against fast food chains, along with a group of activists. In 2022, Edward Mukibi took over. It's a challenge to take uh, uh, over uh, leadership from such a big figure like Carlo Petrini, but to me, it's also, I look at it, at, at it as a learning opportunity. I feel like I have a lot to offer. I have a lot of experience to share with the world from my communities, from my country, from my continent, and that we, this is the only way we can bridge the ever-growing gap between the North and the South. The slow food movement promotes local produce and fair trade, rejecting the trend towards fast food. Farmers seek to preserve biodiversity in their fields. They work with traditional crop varieties and farming methods and respect animal welfare. Traditional methods are also used in food manufacturing. Over the years, the organization has expanded its reach to a remarkable 160 countries. To me as an African from Uganda, Slow Food means a grassroots network that is supporting and working with uh, local communities to build food sovereignty. Uh, we work with uh, communities of farmers, communities of uh, young people, communities of indigenous peoples. Slow Food came to Uganda in 2006. Two years later, Edward Mukibi joined the network. His own family lives from farming, like many in his village, Chisoga. As a child, he often had to work in the fields. I was forced to do agriculture as a punishment at school. But this punishment turned out to be my uh, lifetime passion and driving force to make change. He knows all the slow food farmers in the area, like Noel Nanyunja. She mostly grows vegetables, including rare varieties, and takes care to avoid monocultures. Uh, slow food gardens, we embrace uh, 
diversity in our garden. We also make sure that we try to protect our plants which are at the risk of extinction and they provide food security. Slow Food Uganda has over 30,000 members and is active in many areas. The organization has different facets, including Slow Food Gardens, a Slow Food Youth Network, Farmers Earth Markets with local produce and a so-called Alliance for Chefs and Cooks. To join the, the Cooks Alliance, the first thing is uh, the cook should have is the desire and the willingness to make a change in the food system. Like Betty Nakato, she runs a catering service. Her journey with Slow Food spans seven years, during which she has focused on the art of crafting traditional dishes. Traditional foods have really helped us to really embrace more of our culture and to give us a sense of belonging. I really thank God for the slow food, that they are trying to build that culture to empower us in foods, to have that culture that it's not washed away. It's passing on this culture of local produce and organic farming that Edward Mukidi sees as his main task. Through restaurants, through product, uh, farms, uh, through uh, Slow Food Gardens in Africa, through many other initiatives like uh, the Slow Food Youth Academies, we are able to reach out to so many people. Because only with a clear knowledge on how the food we eat and the system under which it's produced is affecting the planet and our health is when we can make better choices. Many of the slow food farmers in Uganda have achieved more food security thanks to adopting this ecological method. And Edward Mukibi is happy to help them in making their choices. What an inspirational guy. Growing food sustainably and safeguarding food security is becoming ever more challenging. Farmers, especially right here in Africa, are having to cope with extreme heat and long periods of drought. The situation in southern Europe is not much better. But farmers in one part of Spain are finding ways to beat the drought and still see their vegetables thrive. Heat and drought. Spain's agriculture was once again left high and dry last year. But this is also Spain. It rarely rains here, but there is water and even plenty of tomatoes. Why is that? Given the relatively dry conditions that we have in Spain, especially on the Mediterranean, I think it's quite advantageous to grow food in greenhouses. Oh dear, how awful. The classic reaction when it comes to the vast plastic landscapes of Almeria. But while oranges, olives and grains dried up elsewhere, vegetables for Europe grow here almost all year round. This region has always been dry, which is why farmers, together with engineers, make the best of what little water they do have, including with the help of sensors and software. What we achieve here in the greenhouses is a 20 to 30 percent water saving, 20 percent less fertilizer and 30 percent less electricity. The technology helps farmers and the whole region to be more sustainable. In the greenhouses, farmers do everything they can to save water. This tomato grower, for example, doesn't use sensors or even soil. Instead, he puts the plants into a substrate. This way, we save 20% of the water that we would otherwise have wasted, plus the fertilizer that's in there. The irrigated greenhouses is an idea from the 1960s Franco dictatorship in a region where hardly anything grew. Thousands of families tried their luck on a single hectare of land. Estanislao Penado's parents were among them. Together with his wife, Amparo, he still runs his small family business. Green peppers are currently in demand. It's a pretty good living. The greenhouses have improved the lives of 80 or 90 percent of Almerians. Prosperity and less water consumption, two good reasons for the greenhouses. But so far, farmers have been growing more or less the same things. 
field vegetables such as lettuce or broccoli have yet to thrive under cover. But there's one exception. This farm, which grows bok choy under plastic, highly automated with a closed water cycle. It saves 50% on water and fertilizer compared to growing the vegetables outdoors. We have 3.2 hectares here, and we have nine harvest phases per year. In the field, they manage two or three phases on the same area. This greenhouse's efficiency, regardless of which vegetable is being grown, is crucial. Building the greenhouses costs around 150,000 euros per hectare. Not all vegetable types can recoup those costs. Still, there are attempts to grow larger crops under plastic, such as these patayas and these papayas. For scientists, this is just the start. I think that better control of climatic conditions and of pests will ensure better production and quality. That's why I believe that more profit will be made and therefore higher profitability. One scarce commodity is crucial for success under plastic, water, even if you need less than you would growing food in a field. Still, growing more than 32,000 hectares worth of vegetables requires a lot of water. In this case, it comes from a seawater desalination plant, which has to work 24 hours a day. Development and production in the region would be unthinkable without this plant, because the groundwater that the farmers used to use was salty. By expanding wind and solar power in Spain, more and more seawater may be desalinated affordably and sustainably in the future. But that only works on the coasts. If water prices rise overall, greenhouses will also become more interesting outside of the Almeria region. Wow! Just a simple idea, but what a difference it makes. Well, there is a will, there is a way. Our next protagonist knows all about that. He is a volunteer fighting to help nature cope with the drought on the other side of the Mediterranean in Libya. Here is this week's Doing Your Bits. The trees of the Al Markab forest near Libya's coastal city of Al Qums are healthy, even though there's been almost no rain here. It's all thanks to Hussein bin Sassi, an environmental enthusiast who cares for the trees personally. I've noticed in recent years that there's no follow-up after trees are planted. The saplings are not watered. So I decided in 2019 that we need follow-up in these reforestation campaigns. Once the trees have been planted, we take care of them so that they survive. Libya is badly affected by climate change. From extreme rainfall and floods, to drought and desertification, the North African country has seen it all. The Al Markab forest was in a poor state too, until Hussein bin Sassi and other volunteers began watering the trees. We've been able to breathe life back into this forest through our continuous follow-up of irrigating the trees. This has saved and led to a growth of some 3,000 or 4,000 trees. The 65-year-old has been involved in numerous reforestation campaigns and loves to pass on his knowledge to the next generation. He's busy watering hundreds of trees and has no plans to retire. There is effort involved. It's a struggle, an exhausting work. But when I see a tree growing, this motivates me to continue watering the trees, both inside and outside the forest. Staying on the subject of trees, the baobab can be found in large parts of Africa. For many, these trees have deep spiritual significance so they are often a focal point for gatherings. Their fruits, seeds and leaves also serve as a source of healthy food. Indeed, but tragically, climate change is having a devastating impact on the baobabs. And that's not the only threat they face. 
we head to Kenya now where environmentalists are working to rescue this beautiful tree. A baobab tree can store water for months, allowing it to survive long periods of drought. For centuries, these so-called trees of life have played a key role in village communities along the Kenyan coast. Now though, they are threatened by climate change and also rubble. Last year, eight baobab trees, all several centuries old, were exported to Georgia for planting in a park built by a former Georgian prime minister. This led to public outcry in Kenya. How, how do you come to uproot something that is more than 200, 300 years and, and take it away? What are you actually saying to us? Birua Hari Kiraga grew up here on the coast in Kilifi. He can't imagine a life without baobabs. The older trees in particular play an important role for the Mijikenda community. This tree is several hundred years old. It has spiritual significance for local people. If we have drought, um, if we have other calamities, uh, we will come and make prayers under a baobab tree as big as this one. It is one very important uh, element. As a faith symbol, uh, it's a place where we, we communicate with God. And many of the problems that we have uh, have been solved under the baobab tree. Environmental activist Elphick Tossi is on a mission to protect baobab trees. For years, he's been fighting to ensure they survive. The baobab tree is one tree which other countries call it the tree of life because one, the bark of the tree is medicinal. The leaves are useful. The powder is useful. Everything on that tree is useful. And something else, it has lived ages and ages, which means it is very nutritional and it is not like uh, genetically modified. Alfie Tossi is shocked that they are being exported. But he says the real problem is farmers and investors selling barber trees along the coast to make room for agriculture and construction. He regularly talks to people about the tree's importance. They store carbon dioxide and provide nutrients for a wide range of species. Insects and bats thrive on their flowers while monkeys eat the fruit, hence the nickname monkey bread tree. Father MacDonald Munga was not aware of any of that when he had several of his trees felled. We regret that we weren't told anything by the government. They don't inform us, as baobab owners, about all the benefits of the trees, A, B, C, D, so that we can understand better. Depending on its size, a felled tree can fetch between the equivalent of 500 to 1,100 euros. Good money for a local farmer. But a living tree can earn the farmer far more. Its fruit contains a large range of vitamins and minerals. In powder form, it's in high demand internationally as a superfood. The fruits are also popular in Kenya. Betty Kadzo Kalume is a teacher and sells them on the side. That earns her an equivalent of 69 euros per month, a considerable boost to her teaching salary of 200 euros. It provides food and also opportunities for earning money. I don't think the little money that we are given for cutting down a tree could in any way compare to the benefits we gain from it. Elphick Tossi also visits schools in Kilifi to raise awareness about the trees among young people. He tells them about their significance for the local ecosystem and shows how to plant them correctly. We want to have a community that understands better about the environment, a community that uh, knows that they can be able to make a living from environmental uh, things that they do. And as we are focused in planting one million fruit trees in 400 schools in Cliffy County, we want a future that all schools in Cliffy County have fruit orchard. It's an ambitious plan which the activist is pursuing with determination. Together with students, 
He's planted more than 200,000 trees so far. And we wish them all the best with that. It's time to say goodbye. Thanks for joining us today. Do check out Eco Africa online for great stories and ideas. I am Chris Alems in Lagos, Nigeria. Bye, Chris. See you again next week. And to all of you, great to have you along. We'll be back next week with a whole new show. I am Sandra Kahumza Twinovio signing off from Kampala, right here in Uganda. Bye-bye. Oh.